It was on a cold December day after I finished the western tour of British Columbia going along with uh, Theory Vrain and Shiv Chopra on the GE Free Talk Tour that I visited Mr. Harold Steves of Richmond who had been an organic farmer all his life and also a city councillor for Richmond for almost 45 years. And Richmond was the first major town with a substantial agricultural holding or uh, community uh, to pass this resolution in British Columbia to be GMO free, which started a movement, a cascading movement that, uh, that resulted in more and more municipalities doing the same following suit and eventually the Union of British Columbia Municipalities passing a hotly debated resolution for the whole province to be uh, GE free and then passing that on to the provincial government. Now motions are afoot to also try and replicate this at the federal level at the AGM or annual general meeting of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to be held at Niagara in the in the summer of 2014 where if the resolution does get tabled I expect people like Harold Steves and 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 councillors like Wendy Bales and many others to uh, try to visit and be present at uh, at the AGM to canvas on this cause and I was planning to go myself as an observer if possible there's all sort of ex exciting things uh, in the roadmap so anyway I visited Mr. Harold Steves for an interview on the 22nd of December. We have uh, Mr. Harold Steves of uh, uh, Richmond and uh, uh, good afternoon Harold. Good afternoon. Uh, will you tell us what was your, uh, you, uh, I believe you studied uh, genetics. Uh, I, I graduated from the University of British Columbia in genetics and I did my graduating thesis on hybridizing livestock, in other words crossbreeding of livestock. So I know a fair amount about hybridizing and I know a fair amount of, of GMOs and, and the difference between hy hybrids and, and GMOs. I see. And this lovely farm that you have, when did your people come here first? Uh, the family uh, settled here in 1877. And so I am the fourth generation farmer on the site, and our, our son, uh, son's two sons, Rob and Jerry, are the fifth generation farmers. And uh, we raise grass-fed beef. Oh, wonderful. And uh, before uh, coming to Richmond, were you still in Canada? Uh, our family actually lived in New Brunswick for a hundred years before they came here. And before that, they were part of the Pennsylvania Dutch or Pennsylvania Deutsch uh, colony in the United States. So originally the first Steves, was a, his name was Steve, S-T-I-E-F, instead of S-D-E-V-E-S. -E -E and he came from Germany uh, over 200 years ago. Oh, wonderful. And now you are an organic farmer and also a councillor, right? That's right. Yeah, I'm city councillor in Richmond. I've been a city councillor for 43 years. And uh, we, our farm since the day it was founded in 1877 has always been organic. We never learned how to use chemicals because we didn't need them. Wonderful. And uh, your first, I believe you had a, uh, a ban passed on, on pesticides uh, before it came to the GMO free issue. Can you tell us something about that? Uh, several years ago uh, we became very concerned about the amount of pesticides being used in the urban areas of Richmond. Half of Richmond is agricultural and half of it is residential. And so we brought forward a, a, a resolution to ban the use of cosmetic pesticides in the residential area. It doesn't affect the farmers. <coughs> we, uh, uh, the farmers are um, governed under the Right to Farm Act by the provincial government. The city has jurisdiction over the residential area, which is 12,000 acres of Richmond. And so we banned uh, cosmetic pesticides in Richmond. It was quite a controversial discussion at the time. However, it, it has been immensely successful. And as a, as a result of that, do you see any uh, improvement in the city's ability to generate, for instance, uh, compost, organic compost out of the yard clippings? Uh, two, two things happened. Uh, we banned the cosmetic pesticides and later we banned, banned the GMOs. 
What the result has been is that when we brought in a composting program for the city a year ago, we started collecting all of the lawn clippings and all of the leaves and yard waste. And this past six months, we had the compost tested and it is so clean and pure with no pesticides or herbicides in it at all that is equivalent to compost that can be used on organic agriculture. So in the following spring, in 2014, for the first time we are working with putting urban created compost onto farms in Richmond as an experiment to figure out what kinds of organic materials uh, will help recondition the soils of Richmond and what are other additives we may need to add to them to make uh, the compost into a perfect fertilizer. Wonderful. And uh, that was <clears throat> that pesticide van was uh, done about two, three years ago, right? That's, that's right. It was, it was two or three years ago we brought in the pesticide van. And um, initially people said, oh, it, it, people won't do it. What we found was wherever pesticides were being used that neighbors or in, the, in some cases in, in strata titled uh, facilities uh, told others that they shouldn't be using the pesticides and uh, it seems it, it worked really, really well. So we have no knowledge of anybody that's actually sneaking out and spraying anything right now in Richmond because of the do. Somebody will, will tell them, well, if you spray that, you, you may be eating at your dinner next week mm. or next year. Mm. That's wonderful. And uh, uh, you said that <clears throat> because uh, lawn cosmetic pesticide bypassed the farming uh, and therefore it became a jurisdiction of the city, uh, otherwise it would come under the Right to Farm Act. Can you tell us something about this Right to Farm Act? Uh, the Right to Farm Act was brought in some years ago to protect farmers that lived uh, or had their farms along the urban edge. Uh, quite often uh, urban people would complain about odors on farms and li our, our livestock and you know, clucking chickens and things like that, roosters crowing. And so the provincial government brought in the Right to Farm Act to say that if you moved in and, and lived next to a farm, the farmer has rights and the, the, the uh, city dweller cannot go and infringe upon those rights. If there is a complaint on the Right to Farm Act, there's a committee set up to investigate it to, to help the farmer make improvements if, it, if it's something that's that his fault. What happened, however, is that the Right to Farm Act has been expanded to say that the farmer has the right to use the chemicals and the herbicides and the pesticides and uh, do other things that uh, that affect agriculture in general in the agricultural area. And the cities cannot infringe upon those rights. However, the cities do have control over what goes on in the residential areas. And interestingly enough, probably the residential areas was where more herbicides and pesticides were being used. Um, most farmers, most good farmers, uh, don't use a lot of, of herbicides and pesticides if they can help it. But quite often city dwellers, not knowing what the chemicals are, would uh, be using those chemicals quite heavily. And by banning that, we've got clean compost that can be used in the farms and in the gardens in the city. So, uh so I understand that the the, uh, the decision to ban uh, pesticides on the lawns and is working out in multiple levels, including possibility of the city to generate more organic compost for agriculture. Now, and I understand the Right to Farm I Act. Now, uh, coming to the next issue, uh, a year after you uh, passed the ban on on uh, lawn pesticides. Oh, one more thing. I believe you might have, or the municipality has the resolution on what is sold in its stores as against what is grown in the ground. Is that right? And do you have something to say about whether GMO seeds can or cannot be sold within Richmond? Okay, the city has, again, in terms of GMO stock, the city has the right to determine GMO usage in the residential area but because of the Right to Farm Act, they don't. The city does not have the right to control GMO use in the agricultural area, and half of Richmond is farming, and half of it is residential. When we brought in our resolution opposing the use of GMOs in Richmond, it first went to the Richmond Agricultural Advisory Committee, 
And the Agricultural Advisory Committee went right down the middle. Half of them were in favor of banning GMOs and half of them weren't. The ones in, that weren't in favor of banning G GMOs were some of the larger farmers and were farming, were neighbors of three dairy farms that we found at that time were already using uh, GMO corn. The ones that were in favor of the GMO ban were the smaller farms that, that were not using and the, more, and the organic farms. So you have a difference between conventional agriculture point, a conventional agriculture point of view and an organic agriculture point of view. When we looked at it, we said, okay, we will red circle the three farms that are, that are growing GMO corn for the dairy cattle and they'll be exempt because they're already there. We brought forward a bylaw that said, exempting those three, that Richmond was opposed to uh, GMOs being used in Richmond. The farmers on the Agricultural Advisory Committee that were concerned about the dairy farmers did not oppose that. They didn't come to the council in opposition because we had removed the three neighboring farms that uh, that we're already using GMO corn. We're hoping that someday those three farms will go back to, to use non-GMO corns and we've heard that some farmers in the Fraser Valley already are already uh, returning to conventional uh, non-GMO corn instead of using the GMO and we're hoping that'll happen here too. Yeah, that's good. And can you tell us this... Wait, just, I got a cough. <coughs> When, uh, when we discussed the resolution opposing GMOs in Richmond Crop Life, which is a, a, is a, a um, PR arm or PR wing of Monsanto, sent the Vice President from Alberta out to British Columbia to convince us of the error of our ways, and we were not impressed. They told us that we couldn't ban uh, GMOs, and we said, well, what we can do is if you try to sell your GMO seed in Richmond, we can ban the sale of GMO seed. We, because of the Right to Farm Act, we can't prevent the farmers from planting it, but we can ban its sale. And we know we can ban its sale because we have done this before. Several years ago, we found that a lot of puppies were mistreated in puppy mills where they raised a lot of puppies in unsanitary and unhealthy conditions were being sold in Richmond stores, in the pet stores. So we banned the sale of puppies in pet stores. We also banned the sale of domestic turtles and some of the exotic uh, 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 lizards and things like that that uh, are, are some, some are endangered in parts of the world and others in terms of the turtles are are released into our environment and, and endanger our own native turtles. So, so we banned certain species, puppies and turtles and some other species, from the pet stores. The pet stores took the city of Richmond to court, said we couldn't ban them, we won. So we know that we can ban GMO seeds if Monsanto or Syngenta or Bayer or any of these corporations try to sell GMO seeds in Richmond and we told them that when they came to tell us that we were wrong about adopting the GMO resolution. So far they're not, uh, I got a cough, <coughs> so far they're not attempting to uh, sell any GMO seeds in Richmond, so there's relatively peace at the moment. Fantastic. But as soon as they do, we have told them that we are prepared to take them to court. Oh, fantastic. Now uh, tell us about uh if if you may, may your involvement with the UBCM and what happened there and how do you see the road forward? Uh, s several of the communities in BC. Uh, I, actually, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. After Richmond uh, uh, adopted its resolution on GMOs, it, it, there was a groundswell of opposition to GMOs throughout the province. Richmond was the first city with a major agricultural community. Uh, to come down against uh, the GMO seeds. And so a number of communities throughout BC, literally dozens of them were discussing it, quite a few of them passed resolutions, and several sent resolutions to the Union of BC Minality. Several of the cities sent resolutions to the Union of BC Minis Municipalities Convention. It was widely debated at the convention, uh, some farmers that, uh, that were delegates to the convention, the city councillors, 
could not been spoken in favor of GMOs. Other farmers, myself included, got up and said why we didn't need GMOs. And in the end, the resolution opposing GMOs in British Columbia passed at the UBCM convention. This is now policy of all the cities and municipalities of British Columbia. And the onus is now on the executive of the UBCM convention to present that resolution to the BC government. So effectively, by passing the resolution at the UBCM, it is policy of local government to oppose GMOs and it's the job of local government now to pass that information on and tell the provincial government that they should do the same. Now that doesn't mean the BC government is going to do the same, but certainly it's a major step forward in terms of, of uh, changing the way we treat agriculture in British Columbia. <clears throat> so here is a question. Uh, since the municipalities are elected the lower level of government, so <clears throat> we understand Tell me if I am wrong. We understand that uh, when Richmond, for instance, passed a resolution, it reflected the wish of the majority of the people of Richmond, right? That, that's right. Uh, basically, there was widespread support for banning GMOs in Richmond from the residential community and quite a strong support from the agricultural community, although the, the, some of the more conventional farmers were protective of those that were uh, using growing GMO corn. What happens at the federal and provincial level, however, is that the, the major corporations like Monsanto have full-time lobbyists to lobby government and to prevent the kinds of resolutions that we adopt at the local level from happening at the provincial and federal level. And so what has happened is that most of the opposition to GMOs is coming from local government because there's nobody telling us what to do other than, other than our own citizens. And by and large, this, the, the community is overwhelmingly uh, in favor of uh, do, preventing GMOs from uh, widespread use in British Columbia. Mm. So when the UBCM passed the resolution, which was hotly debated, as you said, but nonetheless, since UBCM members are also elected people from, from the different corners of the, of the province, essentially we can say that this resolution that passed is the reflection of the will of the people, wish of the people of British Columbia democratically, correct or not? Uh, basically, uh, because local government is the government that's the closest to the people and the public has said we want a ban on GMOs, the local councils took it to the UBCM. The UBCM represents the public more than any other level of government and the public has said we don't want GMOs and that is now policy of municipal government of British Columbia. So uh, effectively through the UBCM the public, the people of British Columbia have spoken. 